We started this thing, and that was about eight years ago. Amazing things have happened since then. We work with inmates and their families. We uh, teach drug addicts and alcoholics and prisoners how to stop being slaves, how to become free and whole in Christ. So basically, I'm just directing traffic, and Jesus is doing all the heavy lifting. <laughs>
have a, a print, a, a frame print of an empty cross. That's what it says. It says, no looking back, no going back, no plans of his own. Uh, some friends of ours from El Paso, Texas, gave us that. She's an artist. Uh, he was a former Green Beret and uh, truck driver. He had a group, went from El Paso to Charlotte, North Carolina, once a week. And uh, when she gave that print to us, I said, oh, there's a song there. Yeah. Yeah. Love, not the nails that 
family and I lived on the road for almost 10 years in a fifth wheel trailer, and that's how we met Pastor Rick. We would come here from time to time. And then the Lord told us to come off the road and go back to southern Indiana, which is where we were based. And uh, he arranged for us to buy a house, which was a miracle. I didn't know I had credit. <laughs> <laughs> And he, we even got to keep it. That was even more of a problem. I can tell you the reason. <laughs> but my wife and I started a new ministry down there, Christian Formation Ministries. We felt we needed to start a new one because so all of our friends would know that we were starting something that was built on the foundation of what we've been doing before. And we were traveling all over the U.S. and Canada and going to prisons and churches. And I think I've been in every prison in Vermont at least once, probably more. <laughs> and uh, we were living in church parking lots, except when we came to Vermont. We were up at the Eden Mills uh, campground, Lakeview, right there on Lake Eden. So that's where it is. It's up on, it's on the hill on cinder blocks. And I can stand on my deck and look at the lake. And we've got great neighbors, and it's really good. Back in those days, if we let, didn't like our neighbors, we could just move. <laughs> and we had to behave ourselves because we never knew when a deacon would be walking by. <laughs> and it was good. We saw the Lord do a lot of things. <laughs> but I can tell you stories. But he planted us back in southern Indiana, and we started this thing. It was about eight years ago. Amazing things have happened since then. We work with inmates and their families. We uh, teach drug addicts and alcoholics and prisoners how to stop being slaves, how to become free and whole in Christ. So basically, I'm just directing traffic, and Jesus is doing all the heavy lifting. We're a little different than most prison ministries because I made a conscious decision to become part of the criminal justice system in our area. So we have three judges uh, who will release people from prison a year or two early, provided that they do everything I tell them for the next year or two, which is useful. Because even though they may be saved, maybe they got saved in prison, maybe they knew the Lord before, but they just, their life just went in the tank because of the decisions they were making. Uh, they may have a strong desire to change their lives, but they haven't got a clue most of the time about what that's going to involve. And there are several traps along the way that I have seen hundreds of times in the years. So when they get out of prison, especially when they get out a year or two early, I'm their big buddy, I'm their best friend, and they're so happy and I'm there and all that stuff. And a couple months later, the first decision point comes. They want to do this, and they can't do it because that's what sends them back. So I'm sorry, you can't do that. Well, I'm not sorry. I said, you can't do that. You have to do this. So now I'm the big cosmic killjoy. I'm out to ruin your lives. <laughs> So it's very useful having that, you know, I said, well, remember that contract you signed? Remember what the judge told you? He said, if you insist on doing that, then the next conversation I'm going to have is with your probation officer, and they're going to pick you up and take you back to prison today. I said, you really want to do that? No. So now they're mad at me, and they're at me, and they, they sit there in class, and they glower, and they're killing my joy. But then they have breakthrough and maybe for the first time in their lives they've done something different and it worked and they're in uncharted territory now they have no idea what to do next so they get dependent <laughs> and on their buddy again I don't know if you know this or not but 65% um, of the people in prison 80% of the people in jail will go back within three years. But so far, I just count everybody. If I've had six months to work with them, I counted. So far, less than 20% of the people my wife and I worked with have gone back. We've had a couple of deaths. One guy decided he didn't want to do Jesus, he just wanted to do recovery. So I said, oh, okay, go ahead. And uh, 
he did well for a while, but you know, you reject Christ and there are consequences. He committed suicide. Another fellow didn't want to do what I said. He was stubborn, but I didn't have that judge in the background with him, so he would like call me when he was in trouble. We'd talk. He'd do okay. He didn't do drugs. He didn't go back to prison. And one day he hooked up with an old buddy of his, and he shot up the amount of heroin he usually did back in the day when he was shooting up, and he died right there. Junkies stepping over his body until someone noticed he turned blue. And I got to do his funeral. His mother called me, screamed in my ear on the phone, is my son in hell? I said, no, no, he's not in hell. He made a bad decision and killed him. And I gave her a letter that he had written to me from prison before I met him. I gave her the letter. I said, I want you to read that because that, his heart is in that letter. And this is the man he wanted to be. And this is the man that Jesus saw. Because he, our sin doesn't stop Jesus. He sees us not just the way we are, but the way we're going to be. It was a weird funeral. Half the people there were high, <laughs> at least. But it was good. So I've become a community chaplain of sort to a whole bunch of active drunks and drug addicts and stuff. I want you to do my funeral, man, when I die. So when you keep doing what you're doing, that'll be soon. <laughs> I also serve on a volunteer basis as the chaplain of one of the state prisons in Greenville, Indiana, and that's great. Because I get away with everything up there. I have more freedom than if I were an employee. When the superintendent asked me if I'd become their chaplain, I said, yeah, as long as I can't, I don't have to go on the payroll. He said, fine, no problem. Then his next question was, when can we do a tent revival? So now we do an annual tent revival and guys get saved and things get really exciting. <laughs> so the Lord's doing interesting things, you know, so... Here I am, I'm an old drug and drug abuser and, and 33 plus years ago, and here I am sitting in meetings with, with judges and people like that. The prosecutor, if I'm interested in working with someone, they won't, they won't stand in the way of them getting out of prison. That's amazing to me. It's just a, so I'm not bragging on myself, but Jesus is awfully busy in Floyd County, Indiana. <laughs> and there are guys and gals now walking around that used to be in prison. And one guy, nine years old, his brother put a needle in his arm, got him hooked on heroin. I met him when he was in his early 40s in jail. I've known him for years now. He's been out for four or five years. And he teaches Sunday school at his church. It took him a year to find a job after he got out because he wouldn't lie on his application. You know, you have to put you have to put down whether you have a criminal record. Or not. He wouldn't he wouldn't lie on it or leave it blank. So it took him more than a year to find a job. You'd be amazed at the job he got. His company hired him as a security guard. <laughs> he showed me he has uniform on. He was showing me his key ring. He, he had the keys to two major museums in downtown Louisville millions of dollars of artifacts. He had a branch uh, bank key on there. He was crying when he showed it to me. He says, Richard, they trust me. I said, they ought to trust you. He also said it took about a year for the cops to stop pulling over when they saw him walking down the street to ask him what he was doing. Because he, he comes from a notorious criminal family. His, his mother's been in prison for dealing. His older brother was sentenced to 50 years as a habitual offender. So this is like a miracle, walking around. And he's not the only one, so it's really, I 
I love what I'm doing there, but what it meant was I couldn't travel much anymore. But now I've got all kinds of volunteers and mentors and people that take care of a lot of things. And mostly I have fun. So it's kind of cool. I can leave town for a couple of weeks and they don't even call me. They said, Richard, why didn't you call us? I said, well, did I need to? I said, no. I said, good. <laughs> Have fun. So, I'm traveling more now. And <laughs> my family indulges me now that I'm in my 60s.
bless the wounded one. I love to sing his story. Guitar's a way to get sober. I, I had written an instrumental piece on this called The Song of the Whale. And I was just trying to capture the sounds that they make. And my friends liked it. He said, Far out, man, whales. But smoke's more ashy. <laughs> the Lord told me to take the guitars out of the closet and start writing again. And some of my songs, I was able to put new lyrics to them. Others were beyond redemption. <laughs> I used to write songs with titles like, If You Talk in Your Sleep, Don't Cheat on Your Old Lady. <laughs> if you want to keep the six-pack cold, put it next to my ex-wife's heart. You know, really ugly stuff. <laughs> <laughs> said, Lord, I am so glad you scrubbed my hard drive back there. <laughs> took a lot of stuff out of there and I really didn't want to have to think about it. <laughs> but he put something in this. It was, uh, you know, the, he started doing things to people. <laughs> and my wife and I started getting testimonies from folks when they were listening to this song the Spirit of God did something for them. And some people were physical healing, some emotional healing, some people had issues in their lives they were wrestling with, they couldn't get an answer, and the Lord gave them an answer, things like that. And some people just fell asleep in church, which is great, because I like falling asleep in church. I mean, the Bible says we should enter his rest, what better place to do it? You know? 
I'd fall asleep next to my wife on those rare times. My wife and I weren't on the platform, but we were in the congregation. So she'd give me a dig in the eye, you know, wake, wake me up, and said, uh, she said, you were sleeping. I said, no, no, I was resting my eyes. She said, you were snoring. I said, no, 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 no. That was my spirit groaning with inexpressible. <laughs> she didn't buy it. <laughs> So I won't be a list bit offended if you enter Jesus' rest and start snoring. We'll just consider that background. <laughs> so I'd like to finish my part of, of this morning's service with, uh, with this. I, I don't feel led to lay hands on anyone today. I hope you won't be offended. It's, it's something I rarely do, and I think it's because the Lord has other people to do those things in accordance with the gifts that he gives. I, I, I do it when he says go, but if he doesn't say anything, then I just hold back because there are people here who are gifted in that area some people have gifts of healings I don't have that gift though the Lord has occasionally used me in that manner and I would much rather not stand in the way of someone else walking in the gifts that God has given them and the faith that God has planted in their hearts so I will defer to any of you and however uh, However, the Lord leads you from this point on. So let me do this song for you and invite you just to enter in. Let the Spirit of God touch you in whatever way he chooses. And then, brother, I'll, I'll sit down and we'll just see what he does next. Amen. Song of the Wheel.
songs, I was able to put new lyrics to them, others were beyond redemption. <laughs> I used to write songs with titles like, If You Talk In Your Sleep, Don't Cheat On Your Old Lady. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to keep the six-pack cold, put it next to my ex-wife's heart, too. <laughs> really ugly stuff. <laughs> Said, Lord, I am so glad you scrubbed my hard drive back there. <laughs> Took a lot of stuff out of there. I really didn't want to have to think about it. <laughs> but he put something in this. It was, uh, you know, the, he started doing things to people. <laughs> and my wife and I started getting testimonies from folks when they were listening to this song. The Spirit of God did something for them. And some people were physical healings, some emotional healings. Some people had issues in their lives they were wrestling with, they couldn't get an answer, and the Lord gave them an answer, things like that. And 